We'll call the meeting to order the Moorhead City Council, February 25th, 2019. It is 5.30 p.m. <coughs> Madam Clerk, may we get a roll call, please? Shelly Dahlquist. Here. Sarah Watson Curry. Here. Heidi Durand. Here. Joel Paulson. Here. Shelly Carlson. Here. Deb White. Here. Steve Gertz. Here. Chuck Hendrickson. Here. Mayor Judd. Here. We all please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. And we'll move on to item number three, agenda amendments. Madam City Manager. Um, Mr. Mayor, yes, we have several agenda amendments. Um, items number 11 and 12 are gonna, were requested to be removed from consent. So they will be removed com from consent. On the dais and online about new noon today, we updated the agenda on number 16 was added for Moorhead Public Service item, but that is on consent. Number 18 is about the city prosecutor. Handouts are on the dais, but it was also updated online today. And number 19, um, requesting to continue the authority for purchases under 10,000 was added to the agenda, but it was also uh, um, updated online today. And those items are on the dais for the council members, but they were all updated um, today online. Those are all the ones I know about. Uh, thank you, Madam City Manager. Uh, seeing that there have been, <clears throat> excuse me, amendments as stated in items number 11 and 12 has been requested to remove off of consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? Second. Motion made by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Paulson. Can I uh, get a vote in, <laughs> in favor of the motion? Please, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And then for item number four, consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the items that are within the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Carlson. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Number five, approval of minutes. So moved. Motion made to approve the minutes made by Council Member Durand, seconded by Council Member Paulson. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, item number six, uh, citizens addressing the council. Uh, for those uh, that <clears throat> are here that wish to address, address the council, or for those that may be addressing the council in the future, please remember to when you arrive, uh, please fill out this uh, yellow sheet of paper, uh, which will give you, uh, give us notice that uh, there is a person who wishes to speak uh, regarding uh, any items that are not on the agenda <clears throat> at the meeting. And then we will also uh, have that forwarded to our, our city clerk, who will then in turn uh, make yourselves available uh, to speak uh, seeing that there are no individuals here. Madam Clerk, have you received any notice of anyone wanting to speak? Then we will move on to item number nine, I believe. Council Member Gertz. Uh, I have a potential conflict of interest, so I will recuse myself from this, the discussion and the vote, and I'll exit the chambers during the construction, the discussion. Thank you, Council Member Gertz. Except me, okay. Um, 
Mr. Mayor, this item, um, we want to, in, in anticipation of selling this lot, this lot, 4th Street lot, to Epic Companies for their proposed development, which is going through the process right now for incentives and will come to the Council for final approval on the land sale. Um, they wanted to access to the land, even though Burlington Northern still owns it, but we are almost done with the transfer over to the city. So. Um, the Epic wanted it, um, access so they can start doing some due diligence on the lot, some testing of the soil, et cetera. And we thought that was a good idea because we're holding up the actual um, sale because of the Burlington Northern thing. In the meantime, we thought this would be a goodwill gesture to allow them access to the lot as they prepare to purchase the lot. So that's what number nine is. Are there any questions? Council Member White. Thank you, Mayor Jack. <clears throat> um, I was just wondering, what's the expected due date for when we'll obtain the title for the property? And then I was and just tied in with that is, are we expecting the city attorney to start working on drafting the agreement beforehand, or are we waiting until we finally have the title? Okay, great questions. Council Member White. Um, Mr. Mayor, what we are doing is we've already drafted the developer's agreement, the purchase agreement. It's already done. Everything's done. We've been going back and forth with Burlington Northern. It, we anticipate any day. It is going the incentive request. The building that they're proposing is about $6 million in value. That will be going on March 4th to the Economic Development Authority for review and approval there. And then it would come March 11th to the City Council. We fully intend that the transfer after 40 some years will occur from Burlington Northern to um, the city. They've been great to work with throughout this process. We just need to get that quick claim deed signed. So that's where we're at. It's very close. Any other uh, questions for our city manager? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the resolution regarding the access agreement with Epic Companies? So moved. <clears throat> motion made by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Watson Curry. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. You want to get the uh, council member Gertz? <laughs> and then we'll move on to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, item number 10 on the agenda and engineering department report by Dr. Bob Zimmerman. Thank you, Mayor, uh, council members. Uh, this item is in reference to a um, grant from the DNR for uh, flood damage reduction funding. <clears throat> Last November, the DNR awarded $4 million to the city. Uh, those funds have been primarily dedicated to the North Moorhead Flood Mitigation Project, which was the number one priority identified in the city's flood mitigation plan. Uh, essentially, all of that funding has been committed to acquisitions and or building demolitions. Uh, the, the response that we received from property owners was really nothing less than exceptional. We have uh, 14 properties that have either been acquired or are under a purchase agreement to acquire at a future date. Uh, that leaves us with somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 properties that remain that need to be acquired. Uh, just as a side note, as part of that acquisition process, we did offer an option for property owners to rent back for a period of time so they didn't have to move in the middle of the winter. Uh, and a lot of those property owners have uh, elected to, to utilize that option. Um, because of the success and the, the fact that we've essentially committed all of that funding, we engaged the DNR to inquire as to the status of additional funding. Uh, they got back to us and, and informed us that they could make an additional $2 million available to the city. Um, and it really does boil down to if you perform, they tend to reward that with funds available. We've got a great group of uh, staff members working on these acquisitions. So the action uh, tonight would be to authorize the mayor and city manager to execute an amendment to the previous agreement for that additional $2 million, uh, noting that per the previous agreement, there is no additional local match required. So the resolution tonight is the form that's required 
by the DNR for that amendment. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, are there any questions for Dr. Zimmerman regarding this resolution? Council Member Carlson. Mr. Mayor, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, um, of the 11 remaining, would this two million, 2 million go to those specifically? That's the intent would be to focus on those 11 that are remaining. The 2 million may not quite be enough to get all of those acquired, but it'll get us pretty close. Okay. And have there been conversations with those property owners so that <clears throat> once the money comes in that that would be pretty all of the, an expedited process? All of those property owners have been contacted and I think we've had ongoing discussions with all but maybe one or two. So if the process continues as before, I would anticipate within three months or maybe four months we should have that property acquired. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Dr. Zimmerman? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. So now uh, is there a motion, <clears throat> excuse me, on the table to approve the resolution. A motion made by Council Member Hendrickson, second by Council Member Carlson. All in favor, please vote by signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. <clears throat> motion carries. Item number 11. This is a, <clears throat> excuse me, Considering resolution for Millen Overlay on 28th Street North. Dr. Zimmerman, I presume? I think Council Member, Council oh, Member Gertz, Gertz has a yeah, question. I, I'd requested to uh, remove 11 and 12 off of consent. Just um, so I want to just, uh, in our last meeting, we, we approved another one of these, and uh, being that the uh, 80% of the, the costs uh, uh, get uh, put on our debt levy and how that impacts as we, every time we vote for one of these, we are in, a, in essence voting to increase our debt levy when we do our budget. So uh, Bob, if you can just walk through, you know, the standard policy, I want to just make sure we're following standard policy on this stuff and then how does it impact the, the debt levy? Absolutely. So very briefly, all of these projects, uh, street uh, rehab or reconstruction projects, we assess a portion, typically in the range of 30 to 40 percent. The balance of that is paid by the city. So that's the portion that you referenced that affects the city's debt levy. Specific to uh, item number 11 for 28th Street North, the uh, increase to the city's annual debt levy would be in the range of 47 to 48,000. Uh, what that means in terms of the median value home, which has a, a, a value of about 180,000, is a, a, an increase uh, of about $2.38. Uh, and if you'd like, I can give you the item 12 numbers right now just to continue the the uh, train of thought and item number 12, that's Center Avenue from the Red River to A Street. Uh, the increase in annual debt levy for that project is in the range of 45 to 46,000 uh, with an increase to the median value home of about $2.28. But again, these are all according to the city's special assessment policy according to the five-year capital improvement plan. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Paulson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Bob, would the, you talk about the increase in, or increase in costs to uh, uh, property owners to cover the debt levy, um, but we also need to take into account that um, our debt levy gets paid down each year as well, right? So there's some coming off the books, and uh, you know I think there needs to be a more robust calculation, I guess, to determine exactly what the impact would be. Correct. There's, all, there's also later in the budget process there's the impact of new development and what that has, which is not taken to, into account because we don't know that at this point. So these are really an estimate of what that impact may be, but. 
uh, we always try to provide that information to the council so that you're aware that there is a city cost involved in all of these street projects and at least the order of magnitude. I certainly wouldn't take that down to the last penny or five cents or 10 cents in terms of that property tax impact, but some general idea of what the magnitude is. Thanks, Bob. And, you know, I, I appreciate the discussion, certainly, because I, I think it's always good to revisit these things from time to time as well. So thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Zimmerman? Okay. Thank you again, sir. So, uh, <clears throat> Madam City Manager, should we do these separately as far as uh, the resolutions? 11 and 12, we probably can't bunch these together, I would assume. Mr. Mayor, if someone wants to do a, a motion for both to approve, you can. Okay. I move for approval of both 11 and 11. Council Member Hendrickson. I was just uh, wondering if we did go in a public hearing. Is it a public hearing? No. You're calling for a public hearing. Okay. Yeah. Just I want to clarify that. Thank you. Okay. So the motion has been made by Council Member Gertz to approve <clears throat> uh, items 11 and 12. Is there no, a 11A and 11B. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, 11A and 11B. Sorry. Thank, thank you for the clarification. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second then by Council Member Hendrickson. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. So, uh, Dr. Zimmerman did discuss uh, number 12 as well. So, is there a motion to approve item number 12? Item 12A. So, so there's a motion on the table to approve item 12A. Sec or <clears throat> motion made by Council Member Watson Curry, seconded by Council Member White. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I believe we're down to number, no, it's 16. I just want to make sure that was consent. I'm just follow my notes here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Item number... 17. Yes, Mr. Mayor, these are moving right along without our city attorney here. Okay, I will do my best here. Um, this one is, okay, this one results from Moorhead Public Service. Um, the requests that we clarify our collection practices. As far as I know, we've never been asked to give instruction on how they collect the fees that our city fees are passed to. They've been in control of that because it's one bill. So they have the electric, the water, and the city fees all in one bill, which is the way we want it, one bill for our customers and for the citizens. Um, they have had a discretion in how they collect that. Um, in, in the meantime, there's been a lot of discussion about the cold weather rule and the people, the customers who are receiving energy assistance during the winter months. Um, there is a Minnesota cold weather rule that the um, electric may not be turned off during that time for past due payments. And because our fees are on their bill, um, I think it would be wise for the council to clarify, and I'm recommending that you instruct Moorhead Public Service not to turn off the heat during that same time as a collection tool for our city fees. So that's all I'm asking for tonight. If, if you're agreeable, I'd ask for that motion. Um, a second, we'll vote on it, and then you'll send it to the, I'll send it to Moorhead Public Service as an instruction on that part. Next meeting, um, our new finance director and I are working on a bigger, more comprehensive collection payment plan if people are past due and we've never allowed payments or more have public service hasn't and we're going to request you to um, approve a, a, a more um, customer friendly payment plan but that's next time this one's just for the cold weather rule so that's what I'm asking for approval for tonight are there any questions for our city manager regarding this item Councilmember Duran. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Not a question, just a, a, a few words of gratitude. Thank you, Chris, for working on this because 
we have struggled with this in the past and it's been an issue. Um, there is absolutely no reason why anybody should have their heat shut off in, uh, in this cold temperature. Uh, so I appreciate all the work that you put into this and I look forward to the next meeting seeing a more customer friendly um, you know, payment plan option for our citizens. Thank you. Councilmember White. I have a, just a couple of questions. The first one's just, um, I want to make sure, it's for clarification. I'm not sure if I'm reading this right. So under background and key points, that second paragraph, the second sentence says, the fees for wastewater, sanitation, stormwater, street lighting, pest control, and forestry may not be collectible for customers receiving public assistance during the cold weather period. So do we already have a policy that you cannot um, you know, do any, like we couldn't turn off somebody's water during the winter or, I, I was just trying to understand okay. that section a little more. We do not, Council Member White, and that section, maybe we didn't word it exactly, um, so it's easy to understand, but those are the city fees I was referring to, so that's why we listed them like that, okay. because those are the city fees. And what we intended to say was, if they're not collectible, if the people are not paying during the cold weather months, okay. we won't be turning off the electric. Now, your question is about the water, and I do not know... Did we lose our Moorhead Public Service person? Okay, we're, I'm really on my own here. Um, I don't know. In answer to your question about if water is an option, I don't okay. know. Because I would hope I, that I will be check included that out, too, that we wouldn't turn off their water either. I, uh, oh, Councilmember Council Member Duran knows the answer? <clears throat> I can try to help clarify there. If a customer is 45, past 45 days due on their bill, their water can be cut off no matter what time of the year it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that brings up another, another big issue um, with freezing pipes, potential for that type of issue. Um, the cold weather rule specifically states electricity cannot be shut off but it does not state mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. Councilmember White, um, our new finance director, Carla McCall, has been doing a little checking into this. Carla, do you know something about this? Just my experience with utilities. In the winter, as we are observing now, there's a lot of snow. And to turn off water, you have to get down and under the ground and turn a key that actually turns off the water. So it's usually very, it's not feasible for them to dig out the snow, find that particular turn off outlet get down in there and turn somebody's water off with all the snow on top of everything and the ice so typically water is not uh, a tool for shut off in the winter time especially with all this snow it can be done it can be done but exactly. it is not typically something at this area of the country where we can actually get to it so it makes it hard to get to but if you could yes in fact you could shut off water yeah and that's a very good point because regardless of how much snow there is, it, it's still an option that can be done. And so it, we might want to look at including that in yes. our, hot, our cold weather policy uh, because there have been winters where there hasn't been a whole lot of snow. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. it, it can be done. So if someone would like to amend the proposal to include no turning off the water during the cold weather months, you certainly can. That isn't what I proposed, but we certainly can amend it. Councilmember Gertz. So are you saying if we had a winter <laughs> that um, didn't have a lot of snow, by making that amendment, if they were 60, 90 days, 120 days late on their water bill, by making that amendment to this, we wouldn't be able to turn their water off, even though there was no snow. So whether it's snow or no snow, I guess the question is, do do we collect the fees for the water, sewer, and all the other city fees, or do we try to set up a payment plan that would work for them if they're in a hardship situation? So, Council Member Chris, we are going to absolutely come with a proposal for that. This, um, what's in front of you today is only if they're late on the city fees, then this tool will be taken away by Moorhead um, Public Service. Right now they turn off the electric and they could turn off the water. So I was proposing you just say don't turn off the electric in the winter during the cold weather months, right? Um, it's just if they're late. Now I'll come with a different proposal on how to make those so, arrangements. So um, maybe... Uh, 
we um, strike that sentence from you know what we're trying to pass tonight until you have a chance to come back with some options for us because really what you're looking for is support from the council that um, you would comply with state law that says we won't cut off electricity. That's so, correct, yeah. So I, I would think it would be prudent to strike that sentence until you come back with policy and to leave our options open and just to comply with the state law of the cold weather rule. So, Council Member Gertz, you're suggesting that the recommendation read the mayor and city council are asked to support the cold weather rule. Correct. Basically. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that we can do that. No problem. I wonder if clarification would be needed for, I mean, the point is that you don't want, we do support it, but you don't want them to turn off the electric anymore when they're late. How do you say that? Well, that's covered under the cold weather rule. They can't turn the electric Not city off. fees. It doesn't say that. It says electric. No, I understand. Oh, okay. That. So we we definitely don't want to. We certainly support the cold weather rule, mm -hmm. and I think we pass this this uh, um, recommendation based on that, and then we need to have some sort of policy for the city fees, and it gives you some more time to flesh that policy out and then we can vote on the policy and maybe that policy coming forward is hey we're not going to ter ter no, terminate water we aren't going to charge you for your street lighting or it's a um, once you're outside the cold weather rule you have to get caught up you know there's a I think we want to give you the flexibility to exactly. work out those details without hampering you That that's where I'm coming from. Council Member Duran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chris, isn't part of the problem our residents who receive <clears throat> electricity assistance, that money only goes towards their electrical component part of the bill. And so that is how they get behind then on the city stuff, which then makes their bill look like it's overdue, which then still allows their utility to be shut off because it looks as if their bill is past due. Their electricity might be current because they're receiving assistance for that part, but the but the public assistance does not cover city fees. Mm -hmm. So it still triggers a late, you know, penalty. So that's why we it would be good to have. In, in somewhere in here that if you're if you're behind in your city fees because you're getting energy assistance and so your energy is caught up but you're not paying these things you still can't get shut off councilmember I I agree I agree with that um, I don't necessarily agree with that we aren't going to collect for those fees from these residents that don't pay their bill. And, but I would certainly support that we would work with them to get caught up over a payment plan or something like that. Um, the last thing I want to do is give a green light for everyone to, hey, just quit paying your bill during the cold, cold weather months and you won't have to pay for any of that stuff so I had never intended that we'd forgive the fees <laughs> let me clarify this no that was not my intent at all so if I, I didn't word it right you we need to fix that yeah, yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry what I'm saying is if we remove that sentence we we aren't gonna you know disconnect any services you know because we're supporting this um, cold weather rule and but we got to work with, come up with a plan that will allow them to get caught up. That's what I'm saying. Councilmember Duran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's exactly. I, I agree complete, completely. No, I mean, and I, I would bet that most residents uh, would never view it as, hey, I don't have to pay my my utility bill during the cold weather months. I, I think it's the opposite. I think 
for many people, um, paying that utility bill is one of the most important bills, and it's oftentimes one of the first reasons why, why somebody might go to a payday loan place because they can't pay their utility bill and then get stuck in the rut of, you know, and don't get me started on that whole, <laughs> that whole uh, spiel, but uh, we, we definitely want a system to work with our customers so that electricity stays on, water stays on, and they don't have to go to a payday loan place to, you know, make sure that they can pay their utility bill. And I just want to, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you go Councilmember ahead. White. Oh, <clears throat> no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, along those lines, and it sounds like this is going to come later, is that in terms of a payment plan, it, I, w I did wonder what you were thinking about in terms of what that would look like if somebody, um, you know, wasn't able to pay during the cold weather months, that we wouldn't want them to get hit with one big lump no. sum. It needs to be something that then they could, that they could reasonably be able to handle because otherwise we're just, you know, putting them back in this tenuous position. If they weren't able to pay during the winter and then they get stuck with a big bill now that it's warmer, then that could be something that, um, could really be detrimental to some families. Yeah, Council Member White, that's exactly right. We're thinking along the lines of um, once the cold weather months are done, and I can't remember if it's March 15th or something like that, um, then a payment, a payment plan would be implemented to get caught up over the next three months or something. We wouldn't do what, that's exactly what is happening now is that everything is due immediately. So we, we were not intending on proposing that, but you'll have an opportunity to look at that plan. Thank you. Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So if there was a structured payment plan, I mean, would it be part of the regular bill or would it be separate, what are you thinking? Or you haven't gotten that far yet? We haven't gotten that far, sorry. We have to work this out with MPS, too, on how to do this, so. And so if, if I can just interject real quick and only have one question. Uh, so in the paragraph where it states that the city encourages MPS to use other forms of collection during the cold weather period as permissible by state statutes, is it safe to say that has not been defined yet? That's correct, Mr. Okay. Mayor, that's I'm, correct. I'm clear. Council Member Duran. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mayor. Uh, Chris, I know that uh, Commissioner President Dave Anderson has looked at options MP that he has encouraged MPS to take a look at, such as you know an automatic draft out of a bank account that would be you know, separate from a bill, um, small amounts mm -hmm. so that it's feasible. Um, it might be beneficial to talk to him about w the ideas that he had. Absolutely. He and I are on the exact same page okay. on that. So Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Carlson. So I'm just wondering, Chris, if you can just clarify. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you're just simply asking that we, we are asked to support the cold weather, weather rule, whereas electric service must not be disconnected for residential customers receiving public assistance for collection purposes during the specified cold weather period. I think in addition you added water, so no electric or water turnoff. So yes, I think that is what you're saying. No? <laughs> council member, okay, hold, okay. So council member Paulson, we'll start with you and then council member Gertz. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, so to Council Member Carlson's um, question, aren't they required to follow the cold weather rule? It's a state law. Not for, uh, it, the cold weather rule defines electric and water. It does not address other city fees. So they've been using the opportunity, if they're delinquent on other city fees, to turn off the, as a collection tool, it's their only collection tool really right now, and we are encouraging them to look at tax offset. I mean, there are other tools that we do, special assessments, for example. Well, that's another option. So those are all the things I'm gonna come and present to you. you so do you, do you but, understand the distinction? Well, I, I do, okay. but I mean, as I read the statute here, I mean, it's pretty clear that you will not turn off electricity during these time periods. Just it, a point of clarification real quick. Um, just to make this clear, uh, that's, it's for heating sources only. It does not pertain to water. The cold weather rule only pertains to your heating sources. 
And in this case, it would be natural gas or electric, whichever that somebody would have. Natural gas companies also have to go by the cold weather rule, mm -hmm. and it's for heat, and that's the primary. They want to add water, though. Right, but I'm just okay. saying the cold weather rule does not speak right. to water. So when you say you support the cold weather rule, it does not at this point say anything about mm -hmm. water. Good point. Just to clarify. Well, I think Councilmember Gertz. In the um, yeah, I, I don't think there was a, a, a amended right. motion to add the water. I think that was kind of in a discussion. Oh. So it, I saw head nods. <laughs> I think we're making the, of this more tenuous than what we need to, <laughs> because all we want to do is follow the state statutes and support that and send a signal to like, uh, Maury Public Service that do not shut off their power if they haven't paid these and we'll have a policy how to deal with all the other services. Am I right? Yes. yes. It, the water is still a question. Councilmember Hendrickson. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Councilmember Dahlquist brought this up. What if they heat with water, radiator, and they shut off the water? I mean, then they cut their heat source. No, that would be a closed loop. That's closed loop. Radiant, radiant heat is a closed loop system, so it's just got uh, glycol that circulates through the boiler and the electricity or the gas uh, heat the operate the boiler heat the water and it just circulates it's a closed loop so it's not taking domestic water and if you shut off your electricity then the pumps won't work to pump the water through the radiation so it's not a if I don't turn the water faucet on I won't have circulating water it's a separate heating loop system Best case. Pardon? <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to keep oh. track of who so okay. let me since I saw councilmember white will go with you first I was just gonna say I think but also it's a matter of just being treating people humanely and and I would be comfortable making an, a motion to add water to the proposal to say that they cannot turn off water or electric during the cold weather months. And point of clarification before I take anyone else up. So tonight, uh, Madam City Manager, now my understanding is that you're merely asking for us to ask to support, it's not a resolution here, uh, which requires a vote, correct? So, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, that's a very good clarification, Mr. Mayor. I am a, this is operational, so this is something I would just instruct Moorhead Public Service. I would be the one instructing them. I'm asking for your support for me to go and tell them not to turn it off. Stop turning off the heat. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, your support on that. I don't need it, but I want it. Okay? Right, so my, so my point in bringing that up, <clears throat> for those of us who have more questions, is now, I guess, how do we want to define this? Because I guess since we're, it's going to be March when our next meeting and we're going to be outside of the zone. It's April 15th. I misspoke. Oh, so it's April 15th? Yeah, that's what it says okay. in statute. All right, do I just want to make sure I didn't. We need a motion on it? Well, that's my question is I don't think we need a motion or a vote. I think we just need a consensus to give Madam City Manager direction to go back to more public service saying that there's council support for her to direct. I got a question. Uh, Council Member Carlson. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chris, would it be easier to bifurcate these two issues? Because if it's just because we have a state statute that specifically spells out the cold weather rules um, and that's specific to electricity or the heat um, and it has dates in here and it has um, the statute talks about process a process for disconnecting and all of that. Would it be easier to have um, a resolution or whatever it needs to be specific to that and then something in addition to the other things that aren't covered specifically by state statute, such as the water and other fees? Councilmember Carlson, I think that's a good idea. That would provide clarity for when I go speak to um, Moorhead Public Service. But again, I don't need a vote. I need you to unanimously or majority say okay Chris 
we don't mm -hmm. we ask that you not turn off the electric follow the cold weather rule to your point councilmember carlson and then um also tell them not to turn off the um, water for late fees for late city fees that's really i think what i'm hearing and that would be great if you could tell me that as a group councilmember duran thank you mr mayor um chris i would also um like to and maybe i'm i might be the only person i would like you to have a conversation with MPS regarding their re-hookup fees that oh. they charge. Um, so it, I'm not saying that those need to be those need to go away or anything like that. But I would like to see that conversation about uh, reviewing those policies or that that practice of you know charging an extra 100, 150, or I'm not even sure what the amount is to mm -hmm. re-hook up um, uh -huh. any utility that does get shut off. Understood. And if it's in the winter, obviously the cold weather, we shouldn't have this issue. There, right. sh there shouldn't be any rehookup fees, but you, you just never know. I hear you. Thank you. I agree. So, and before I get the council member Paulson, I just want to make sure that as we're throwing these things at Madam <laughs> City Manager, She's asking for us to, as a group, endorse and co-sign mm -hmm. on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, so are you asking if anyone, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> but what I'm asking is that if anyone has any dissent as far as what Great. we're asking her to do, be sure to speak up because it's going to be all of us on mm -hmm. top of that. Uh, Council Member Paulson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Um, I, I guess this goes back to my, my last question, I, you know, I, and I don't know if I fully got an answer to it. It, it feels like when I read through the cold weather rule, um, I don't, is more public service following all these procedures? <clears throat> because it, it appears that we're talking about a situation here where they're not following these procedures and we're trying to allow you to give them direction to follow the procedures. The procedures are already clearly laid out here in state statute and this is the law that they need to be following. So are they following these procedures or not? So I wonder if I should take the fifth on that. You can't. <laughs> well, you know, I would I would I would say just as a point of clarification that uh, Madam City Manager is the is not employed by MPS. Uh, she cannot speak on behalf of MPS, and nor should she take any position to interpret if they're following the law or not regarding that. I think that might be a uh, question that should be directed to uh, the executive director or member of the board. Thank, thank you. For, and I agree with you. That's uh, very well put. Um, I guess my perspective is is why why are we um, talking about something that's already been codified in state law? I, I mean, it just it, it seems like we're we're adding additional um, or we're, there's redundancy happening here in my mind. Point well taken, Councilmember Gertz. I, I agree with you, Joel. I, I think what what happens is even though that. They, the electricity is, the power part of it is getting paid for through this uh, special funding from the state. Mm -hmm. um, MPS sends the bill with all the city services on it. And so then the bill is delinquent even though their power isn't shut off. And then they try to do that because the city services bills. But I agree with uh, the mayor that this should be brought back to the more public service commission to deal with and um and we just support complying with state law yeah i i, I understand that as well um but the you know that's just because they're not paying a different fee i, I think this law still holds true that you can't turn off their heat uh i mean there it doesn't refer to any other um, fees, but it says explicitly you shall not turn off the heat during these dates. And, and regardless if they're late on their electric bill or if they're late on their forestry fee. So. I think there's been some pretty good discussion on this and I appreciate everyone's perspectives on this. Is there anyone else uh, 
that has any uh, questions or comments for our city manager. So I guess at this point, should we table, uh, I guess this, uh, well, the, or, because I mean, I guess. I don't think there's anything to table. I think so you've given fine. me your direction. Yes, thank so you. You have the direction. Or support. Your, That's your, what I needed. Your support. Yes, thank goal. you. Or we all, can we safely say that we're consensus that Madam City Manager has direction and we're supportive? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. The item number 18, which is a resolution to authorize a budget adjustment for city prosecutor budget and expenses. <clears throat> okay, this really is not supposed to be the city manager show tonight. Um, <laughs> so this one has been a long time coming. Here's the good news. Um, under financial considerations, it is asking for a transfer of $115,000 from, and I'll back up, but from um, reserves, we think we found, in fact we did, we have a very um, proactive new um, financial, um, or finance director, who found $82,240 um, in savings from a deductible, from our insurance deductible. We currently have a deductible of $1,000, which is very, very low for a city of 44,000 people. And we are gonna increase that to $25,000. When you look at the claims in our past history, et cetera, we will save $82,000 per year by changing that deductible. Hence, it will go towards this 115000 So we will not need to take that much from reserves. In fact, we may not take any from reserves if the other cities are on board and they pay us 20%. So that's the difference versus what you have in your mayor and council communication. Um, and I'll back up now. The mayor and council communication is asking that you approve the budget, because there wasn't a budget in 2019 for the city prosecutor's office, and it goes through to explain the history. And then the chart on page 56 of your packet outlines if we, we had always planned to have two attorneys and two um, clerical staff, and if we had have been able to do that, the, we would have actually been at $396,000. Um, that's top chart, page two, for 2019 per year. Currently, we're paying 342. I'm sorry, that was 396. We're paying 342 now. You remember we agreed to pay 432 to the county. We would have been able to do it for 396 if we could have already used our lease space in the law enforcement center. Because we could not, because we have to have attorneys running back and forth now, we, the, the fee for 2019 will be 519. That's for adding another attorney. And that includes all their benefits. So it's not the salary, we have about a 30% add on for benefits. So what you're seeing on your sheet here is for 2019 the budget for that office will be five hundred nineteen thousand dollars approximately the employees are new they have not all picked their health insurance yet so there could be a little bit of difference in that savings are a little bit higher but it'll be close to 519 we the city of moorhead will utilize about 80 percent of those services based on our caseload and pop population the other cities if they go get on board will pay us back about 20%. They have not decided because this is an increase and because um, we understand the county did en end up offering them an, an, a, a, a contract re very, very, very recently to the small city. So we don't know what they're gonna do. In the end, it doesn't really matter because the city of Moorhead needs prosecution services and we're the majority of the budget anyway. So the next um, point beyond the budget is that um, there are upfront costs, and they were actually absorbed in the budgets, I believe, um, in the operational budgets for the furniture. It wasn't that much. And other things, we gave them an old copier, et cetera. So the upfront costs, the city of Moore have absorbed, and I think that's proper because we had to set up the office anyway. And then I'm also proposing that city of Moorhead pay the first year budget on this, and they reimburse us what they've been reimbursing the last several years. So my point is that $100,000 increase, um, I'm suggesting that the city of Moorhead, because we need the services anyway, it's a, we would have needed all this anyway, that we pay the higher amount. These small cities have very little room. We're talking $1,000, $2,000 for these small cities, and it, to them it makes a lot of 
um, a big difference in their 2019 budget, which was already proposed and approved. So I'm suggesting that we, City of Moorhead, cover that difference. I just told you how we would cover that difference, so we have the money. And then um, we are negotiating with them a formula for calculation, those of those who are going to come with the City of Moorhead for 2020, 2021, 2022, et cetera. And then John can add more. That's what I know. Yeah, um, <laughs> thank you, Chris. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council meeting, I, I just come from the Dilworth uh, City Council meeting, and Dilworth, as a percentage of that approximate 20%, is the majority. They're about 15 to 16% yearly. Uh, their council, uh, they waited on taking formal action because you hadn't taken formal action yet. Uh, and so uh, they, uh, there was general consensus. There was no objections. They thought that the what we'd laid out was a, a good proposal. So I'll still need to go talk to the smaller cities. But as a percentage, uh, Dilworth, Glennon, and Holly are between 5 or 6% per year. So. so they're mostly all coming on board. So we'll get reimbursed. Does that make sense? Any questions? And, and I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the council. Uh, you gave uh, the city manager and myself a lot of leeway in, in getting this done. So I uh, really appreciate that. And we do have the lead prosecutor here if you have any questions about the caseload or anything. She, they're really busy. Council Member Gertz. <clears throat> so in the, um, the number two uh, scenario where you have estimates for the three attorneys, 2019, <clears throat> uh, there's like a 12% increase in the compensation for the attorneys. Is that due to it being 11 months this year and 12 months next year? So uh, it, it really wouldn't because we've paid uh, the county for January. So we'll actually realize that expenditure next year. We wouldn't. We wouldn't have that. Councilmember Gertz, Carla, did we? Is this calculated on 11 months for 2019? Did you take that into account? Carla did that calculation. Uh, yes, we did take that into consideration for the 2019. We took it. Uh, as for 11 months, because they all came on board sometime in January, mm -hmm. so we didn't do a full year. We did discount it by the one month that they were new coming in. Um, and some, so some of those increases you're going to see is because we're going to the 12 months next year, plus there's a couple of step increases that were negotiated when they came on board that will raise it a little bit. So it's not, and then plus the already approved cost of living is in there. So. There's a few of those things that are play into that 12% that you're noting, but they are all anticipated. We've got our standard 10% um, health insurance increase every year. That's in there. 3% cost of living is already approved by the union contracts. And then the step increase, every employee gets it until they max out their salary range. So that's, and, that all adds up to the 12%. And had we been able to come to terms with the agreement that the county wanted to uh, for our bill for this year, what, can you remind me what that bill was? Um, uh, well, um, we only paid them one twelfth of the three forty two okay. that we were paying them. There was a, some discussion among all the five cities. We had a meeting with them the other day whether we should pay that bill because we didn't feel like we received service in, or the full service in January. Um, but we decided just to pay the bill, be done with the contract, and move on. So we but are. Paying what the bill. was there? offer to the city to provide those services in 2019. Uh -huh. For 2019, it was $431,000. That was for, yes, $431,000. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the estimate for 2019, that total is roughly, well, 519, 523. That would not include, or we would, towards the end of the year, deduct that 20%, which would be about 103,904. So really the cost to the city is the 519 minus about 100,000. That's correct, Council Member Carlson. Okay. And I just told you about 82,000. So we have actually have a net gain <laughs> for this whole year because we have that savings. So it's not gonna cost, it's gonna cost us less than it would have otherwise.
Any other questions for our city manager, city attorney? Council member White. Uh, along the same um, line, so that was for 2019. Would we anticipate if we were to look out to 2020 and 2021 that the costs that we'll incur now that we're doing this on our own will end up being less than what we would have paid had we stayed with the county? So Council Member White, it absolutely would have been less, and that was never a factor, though I need to point out, we were forced into the situation of doing it. It was never a factor like we could do it less than, but we would have done it less than with the same two attorneys and two um, clerical if we could have been over in the law enforcement center. There's no doubt that would have been less, but we had to hire another attorney, so there, we're not talking apples and oranges here. I understand. I know, I just, just so we, I just, because even going back to what council member Carlson just asked so that's why I'm just uh, I understand that that it was uh, in many ways out of necessity but just so we have it um, on the record of seeing what we would have paid compared to what we are going to pay and so it sounded like if my, maybe I misunderstood this it sounded like when your response to council member Carlson's question I interpret it as in the end, we're actually paying less this year than we would have paid had we been to the, if had we stayed with the county, and is that, in, and then I was asking if that would be the case for 20, 2020 <coughs> and 2021. So maybe we, going back to Council Member Carlson's question, what would we have paid had we stayed with the county compared to what we will incur now? The, so so now we're looking at for twenty. 19, the uh, 519, um, 523, what do, you know, and, and, and I don't know if you have this readily available, but what would we anticipate having um, as our expenses for those years had we stayed with the county? Just so we, just not that, you know, I, I'm not revisiting our reasons for doing it or anything, just so we know. Well, um, Council Member White, it's important to remember Remember that they gave us notice, so it's yes. not like we had a choice here. No, I, I completely um, understand that. Yeah. But in 2019, their proposal was $431,000, okay. and if ours would have been 396, as I show on chart one, but we had to hire another attorney, so it's 519, and then the next year it would have been right. 511, and in 2021 it would have been 617. But even that 519 is actually not our, in the end, we'll recoup some of that yes. from the other city. So That's the 519, correct. you can't really just look at the difference between the 431 and the 519. The 519 isn't what we'll end up having to cover in expenses because it'll actually be somewhat less than that. So I'm, right? Um, well, I think Council, Council Member, Carlson. yeah, sorry. Point of uh, clarification, yep. Go ahead. Yep, yeah. Council Member White, you're asking like the 519, if we deduct that 20%, right. which is about 103,000. I'm not great with the, uh, what is that? About 406,000 is what actually the city cost will be in 2019 compared to the 431 that was offered the county. That's what I was getting at. Is that in the end, does, doesn't that seems to indicate that once we recoup the money from the other cities, that in the end we'll actually have our expenses will be less this year than they would have been had we stayed with the county. That's what I'm trying to make sure I'm interpreting interpreting this correctly. Is that correct? I, not exactly. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, the amount the county was proposing to us, we would have entered into a contract with them, and then we would have recouped the same 20%. Oh, okay. So, no. So it's a wash. Okay. It's a wash. So, yes. Okay. That's what. Councilmember Watson Curry, you looking like you really want to say something? Okay. Councilmember Gertz. But I think the important thing to note is if we would have stayed with the county, we would have had two attorneys. Now we have three. So obviously that's going to be an increase in cost. And I don't, was that factored into their increase to 511 and 617? 
Yeah, they were adding staff. They were adding a clerical years out. They were adding one more attorney in the middle. Um, it's also important to note that they had the infrastructure set up already, so they had, were charging us for their newest attorneys who did the misdemeanor and petty misdemeanor cases, the lower level cases, and we hired very qualified attorneys that um, are not the lower level attorney. So there's some disparity there. We have a different um, level of attorney doing it than they had, so we were paying for a low, lower level of attorney. So there's so many factors. It's just a different model that we're providing. And the service, it's very important to note that the service is what we're priding ourselves on. Our lead attorney is going out um, and meeting with all the police chiefs, all the police officers. Um, we're, our, our city attorney is going out and meeting with all city councils and having discussions about what expectations are, what sentencing guidelines are, is there opportunities to increase revenue. So those are all discussions we're having and we're partner with the other cities. That's also the difference. We're no better than or have any more the authority than the other cities. We're all equal. We're all one partner and we have a team working on this. So there are efficiencies and, and value there too. And, and, and if I may interject and piggyback on uh, City Manager Volkers, I think you have to stress value. I mean, we have uh, three very qualified, very competent, very educated attorneys. Uh, and you have to be competitive if you want to recruit top people to these jobs. Uh, second of all, if we're talking about value and what you just stated, uh, Adam City Manager, is the fact that these, these individuals are focused on our cases, our city's cases, the smaller jurisdiction cases. They're not sharing a caseload with anyone else. They're building relationships. And that you have to, you can't put a price tag on that. Um, and so I think that's really, really important. Council Member Gertz. I make a motion to approve the resolution to authorize a budget adjustment for the city prosecutor budget. And I'll second it. So the motion has been made by Councilmember Gertz, seconded by Councilmember Hendrickson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We're moving on to item number 19. Gosh, this is me again. Okay. Um, this. And if I may state, this is a resolution delegating authority to the mayor and city manager to enter into professional service agreements with employment agencies for temporary employees and contracts having a value less than $10,000. So this was something that the city attorney suggested that the council approve in 2017. So we didn't have to bring every single little contract to you. So let me give you an example. We had to sign up the prosecutor's office for software so they can get online with the cases um, to look up cases through the county attorney system. And so that is less than $10,000. So the mayor and I have authority under this agreement to sign those contracts. They don't need to come to the council. We don't have to have all that extra time and effort. Um, I didn't realize it expired. We've been processing contracts and expired January 31st, so I went a little crazy when I figured out it expired, and that's why it's on the agenda quick today, because I would request that we continue it. It's just for ease of administration, but if you do have concerns, please ask. John, did anything else? He did not miss anything. Okay. Motion has been made by Councilmember Duran, seconded by Councilmember Watson-Curry. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Number 20, Mayor and Council Reports. Any Council members wish to speak? We can provide a report. Council Member Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to share a notification that I received in my inbox. The uh, Moorhead Business Association is soliciting um, for vendors for their diversity job fair, which is coming up pretty quickly next month. It's March 26th from 10 a.m. Uh, to 12 p.m. Um, and that I just think it's a really uh, awesome event that they have. They partner with a number of organizations in the ta in in town and offer translation and um, uh, job placement support at the event as well. Uh, there is still input. I don't have it pulled up, but there is still input being taken on the Highway 10 and 75 um, uh, through MnDOT, so I believe that's through the Metro Cog. Joel, you're nodding like you might know where to send people, but I think for about another week they'll be collecting input on those corridors. I think they can go to Metro Cog's website and there should be a link for that project. To, yes. You know. Thank you. Um, so they're just two really important corridors in our community and um, 
there could be a lot of changes between now and uh, 2025 when they're redoing those. So it would be great to have citizen input on that. Um, the Arts and uh, Culture Commission meeting was canceled for February. There wasn't any business to, um, to move forward, so we'll meet in March. And uh, yeah, I, I think you'll touch on the, the coffee coming up. I will, okay. absolutely. So those are all the things that I wanted to report. Thank you. Any other council member reports? Council member White? Yes, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Human Rights Commission meeting that I attended. So one of the things that we discussed was the n item that we asked to have put on their agenda to look at the recent alleged incident of um, housing discrimination. And so they had a discussion of ways that we could better educate um, landlords, um, people who may have experienced housing discrimination. And so I know they're putting together some recommendations that will come to council, I believe, at our next meeting. But we had a good discussion about may perhaps reaching out to the individuals that were involved with this incident, but also looking at places where we might um, provide education and other things through some of our landlord trainings, for instance. And so expect to see that soon. And then I also wanted to mention, um, I received an announcement that I thought I would share that at Concordia, the um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee is putting on a poverty simulation uh, March 21st, and it's from 3 to 6 p.m. And it's, uh, um, you do have to register for it, but it's an opportunity to, um, to um, gain some insight on the experiences of people who are living in poverty. And so I encourage people who are interested to, um, to apply. They do have a limited number of spaces that are available. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member White. Uh, anyone else uh, have any reports they wish to provide? Council Member Paulson. I'll do a, just a quick update on diversion um, activities. So there's, uh, just so everyone's aware, um, the diversion is moving forward with land acquisition at this point. Um, now that the Minnesota permit is, has come through, there's been some um, opposition from the Buffalo Red River Watershed District, uh, who is uh, considering contesting the, the state permit. Um, the, the state of Minnesota has uh, come back and said that uh, they believe their permit is, is very defensible. Um, and so uh, we do anticipate that issue to continue to move forward and probably get some more clarity on where that's going to end up in the next month or so. Um, it, as far as uh, the funding is concerned, uh, the North Dakota State Legislature is talking about an increase of $300 million uh, to pay for the extra plan B costs. Uh, the federal government has also been uh, discussed to pay $450 million of the additional plan B costs. Um, and so the, those, uh, those discussions are ongoing um, and we'll see uh, uh, how that kind of all settles at the end of the, the North Dakota legislature. And uh, I think uh, when the president's budget comes out in March, um, maybe uh, provide some more clarity uh, to that effect as well. So. Thank you, Council Member Paulson. Is there any uh, other council members that has any reports they wish to make? <clears throat> I'll be brief to piggyback off uh, Council Member Paulson. Uh, I attended a uh, discussion with the Minnesota DNR. I believe that discussion took place back on the 13th of uh, February, uh, getting an update about the permit and where we're at with the uh, process and reaching out uh, to, again, uh, affected landowners uh, south of town here. And so that was a good discussion. I attended that with the members of the Diversion Authority. Uh, also, point of note that uh, there were uh, two new police officers that were sworn in uh, who are currently going to be doing their uh, training. Very excited, showing my age. Uh, I coached one of them in football and I taught one of them in my criminal justice class. So that was a pretty a uh, cool thing to see as we're growing our own here uh, to remain in town and keeping our uh, law enforcement uh, office nice and full. Uh, also, a heads up regarding those that want to attend the coffee with the mayor and council uh, that will be uh, this Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. at the Moorhead Public Library. I was asked uh, if people can bring kids, if there would be cocoa available. So I'm not sure if there can be cocoa that would be really nice if there can be some cocoa there for the kids as well. Uh, the focus will be with our first ward <clears throat> council members, uh, Shelley Dahlquist, uh, uh, Sarah Watson-Curry. Uh, we will, everyone's invited, but 
uh, the focus will be for those that live in those wards who don't get a regular chance or opportunity to see the council members. Uh, they will be there. And the hope is to go uh, every month a different ward. So the goal is to hit every ward at least twice. Uh, and my math is off, maybe three times a year. We were a little behind. But uh, so feel free to bring all your questions regarding anything and everything Moorhead. So we'll be uh, there uh, to answer any questions. If we don't know the answer, we'll find it out for you. So with that being said, any other council member White? One other item, uh, I will add that uh, several members of the city council and some of our city staff will participate on March 10th in a um, fundraiser, it's a, a Hope Inc., a nonprofit that's housed here in Moorhead that provides adaptive equipment um, so that everyone can participate in fun um, sports activities. They're hosting a, um, a sled hockey tournament and we'll be participating in that at noon on the 10th. And so if anyone's looking for a good laugh, <laughs> come and watch us, it's sure to be hilarious. <laughs> And if I am seen in a sled and I cannot get up, please do not film me. Uh, that might be a little embarrassing. But it's all for the kids, right? So uh, any other reports to bring uh, for the good of the order? Seeing none, then we have item number 22 for the executive session. Uh, my bad. I'm sorry. You can, God, you, I know I've talked here, enough. You've been the show all night, so I no. just figured, you know, my I'm sorry. apologies, Madam I just have one little thing. Not a little thing. I want to introduce our new city clerk, Michelle Brecken. She started last Tuesday, I think, and we stole her from um, Crookston. And so we're certainly glad she's here. We welcome her, and she was, she's kind of working. Jill's training her, and she'll be at the city clerk station. And anything you need city clerk-wise, Michelle will handle it. Welcome. Welcome, Michelle. Welcome. Thank you for being here. That's all. My apologies again, Madam City Manager. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry, we do have one more thing. Dr. Zimmerman. He's going to give us an update on the possibility of flooding. Mm -hmm. I so thought that, that was important that we do. I'm and sorry, Bob. Sorry. No, not a problem. <laughs> or as I said all of last week, no problem. <laughs> uh, so we have a very brief nine slide PowerPoint thing. Shouldn't take more than a, a few minutes. I hope. As uh, well as a precursor to this, you may have all seen that last late last week, the Weather Service issued an updated uh, forecast, and some of the terminology used in the in that update s sort of leads you to believe that there's a huge concern. In fact, I don't think it's a huge concern, but given the fact that a lot of faces here are new to Flood fight efforts, we thought that it'd be worthwhile to just give you all the same background. And we can provide updates as we get additional forecasts in the future. I did borrow a couple of slides from uh, a presentation the Weather Service uh, made via webcast last Friday. So these first couple came from the Weather Service. Uh, you'll, you'll note that they're identifying uh, an increased potential for significant snow melt flooding uh, above normal conditions. Uh, March temperatures are really, and precipitation, will really govern uh, how this all plays out. Right now, their Climate Prediction Center is forecasting below average temperatures for at least the first half of March, if not for all of March which sort of pushes the snow melt all back uh, into later March, April, sort of increases the risk of, uh, of significant flooding. They will be issuing these updates uh, roughly every two weeks, and then they'll transition to uh, weekly as we get a little bit closer. I recognize this is probably very difficult to read, uh, and we can provide these slides uh, uh, should the council want them, but this is a new format uh, that the Weather Service is trying out this year to try to convey the forecasts. At this stage of the game, they issue what are called probabilistic forecasts. So what it identifies is certain percentages uh, of likelihood and then stages that go with them. Uh, on the left side of this is just the river stage. Uh, and the short 
bars, the sort of the ladder that goes up the center, identifies different stages and percent chances. So uh, the, the most recent forecast indicates a 50% chance of river stage 31. Uh, and just going up a little higher, 25% chance of 33.7. A uh, ten percent chance of thirty six point one and a five percent chance of thirty six point nine. How does that compare? The two thousand nine flood of record was uh, forty point eight. So this is a, a pretty good way, I think, to uh, to visualize what those likelihoods are of different uh, different flood stages. So what all does that mean moving forward? Again, I borrowed this one from the Weather Service. A number of factors that go into determining how severe spring flooding might be, uh, starting on the, the left side, the fall, fall moisture, soil moisture, uh, base stream flow, frost depths, uh, winter snowpack, and snow water content. Uh, a lot of information is known about the fall moisture. Uh, base stream flows are normal to above normal. Frost depth for this time of year is normal to above normal, the winter snowpack likewise, and snow water content are normal to above normal. Moving forward, the winter snowpack obviously can change and most likely will change. Uh, snow water content may change. And then the big, the big impact really comes from six and seven. How does the thaw cycle uh, play out as well as what sort of precipitation might we have while that is moving forward. I would note about the snow water content, the, the area south of town is in the range of three to four inches of snow water content. Just by comparison, if you were to go back to 1997 or 2009, uh, those years had five to seven inches. So the, the quantity of water that's out there currently is not the same as it was for those major flood years. A little bit about what we do. This, the table here is just an excerpt from our flood plan. It's not intended to be legible in any format here. What I want to point out is we have a very detailed flood plan that takes us to roughly uh, river stage 43 feet. As you may recall, top of levees that we've constructed is at 44 feet. There's a lot of activity within that plan, uh, roughly 300 or more than 300 different action items that we, we would consider uh, all the way through those, that flood stage. What, it, what does that mean um, in terms of what we would implement moving forward? I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. I did want to point this out, though. This is also part of our flood plan. In addition to having that in a, in a text format, table format, this is all uh, in our GIS system. Uh, that allows us to, to, to map these activities as well as track these activities. And this is just an example of a map of one area of town. Again, not necessarily intended to be legible, more to show you that there's a lot of background to the city's flood plan. So just to, to provide an example, if you recall from the previous slide right now, the uh, the predicted 50% chance uh, event is a 31 feet river stage. What does that mean in terms of what we need to do? What does that mean in terms of what the public might see? Uh, for that river stage, there are 75 different action items uh, that are considered for implementation. I specifically use the word considered because depending upon the uh, potential for a river stage to go higher, we may or may not implement every one of those. Uh, if we do reach river stage 31, there's a bullet list of some of the, uh, the items that would be more obvious to the general public. A lot of what we do is sort of behind the scenes. So of those 75 different actions, some of that involves closing gates on stormwater structures, activating pump stations, things that people really don't see. This list is more of the things that people would see. Uh, for example, the bike, bed, bike ped bridges would go up. Uh, Gooseberry and Woodlawn parks would both 
uh, be flooded as well as the shelters. Third Street underpass would be closed. The, uh, the Broadway Bridge going into North Moorhead, formerly Oakport, would close. Uh, the 15th Avenue North, former Toll Bridge, would close. I would note this would be the first flood event that's actually a city-owned facility. Previously, it was private owned, privately owned for all flood events. Uh, River Shore Drive uh, beneath I-94 would close. First, the First Avenue North underpass is sort of right on the verge of whether we would need to close that or not. For River Stage 31 feet, there is no private property impacts. I think the first private property impact is more in the range of 32 to 33 feet. So what does that mean moving forward? Well, obviously, we'll continue to, uh, to monitor those forecasts. At a staff level, as we do prior to any flood event, we go back to that detailed flood plan, review every step in there, make sure that we've, we've got it right, we've got it clear, and there haven't been any updates needed. Uh, another big thing that we do is look organizationally at how we respond to these. This is not a single department issue. This is a cross-departmental effort, engineering, public works, administration. The whole group has a role in this in some way, and so we, we look at how we organize ourselves. We obviously have examples from previous flood events, but there's always opportunities to improve, and so we'll take a look at that. In addition to how we coordinate externally, uh, partly through the, with county, through the EOC, but potentially with other agencies, if that were needed, for example, the Corps of Engineers or the National Guard. That's not something that looks like it would be needed for this event, but we do consider that. Uh, as weather uh, starts to improve, we go through all of the, uh, the existing flood infrastructure, inspect and exercise that as we, as, uh, to make sure that it will function properly. Uh, we will also, at some stage, do a tabletop exercise just walking through each of the steps for a given uh, flood stage. We'll provide you with additional briefings as we have more forecasts if they're needed. Uh, in the past, we've done public outreach, but that's really a function of what's forecast uh, and the level of outreach that may or may not be necessary, so that's sort of a TBD. The point of all this is to give you some background on what we will be doing in preparation for whatever should materialize this spring um, in case you should get questions and that you should know that it's on our radar and not something that you should be excessively concerned about at this point. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take a shot. Well, thank you, Dr. Zimmerman, for the uh, presentation. It's very important for us to be on top of that. Does anyone from council have any questions for Dr. Zimmerman? Okay, seeing none. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Appreciate it. We move on to uh, item number 22 on the agenda, which is a uh, executive closed session pursuant to Minnesota Statute 13D.05, subdivision 3B, for the purpose of attorney-client consultation regarding issue related to correction of legal title issue relating to city utility easements. And is there a motion to enter into executive session? Uh, motion moved by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Duran. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. We will now move into executive session.